Yes. Yes. That, okay. yes. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is afternoon now. My presentation was meant to be in the morning, so it's thrown me off straight off by having to say good afternoon. I'm going to talk to you a bit about the energy density needs of batteries for uh, uh, luxury electric vehicles. Um, we all know why we're doing this. Uh, CO2 emissions um, are uh, fairly significant from uh, the uh, transportation industry. If you look at just at the, uh, if you look just at passenger cars, something like 10% of CO2 emissions in Europe are down to uh, uh, to passenger cars. Smaller cars uh, emit less uh, CO2, and there are new technologies coming in which are particularly applicable to small cars, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but probably small cars can't afford them, so that means there's an opportunity for the premium luxury market. So just a little bit about Jaguar and Land Rover. Um, start off with, uh, with Jaguar. Fast, beautiful cars, I think, is the uh, strap line that we tend to use. Three models that we uh, produce. The XJ, which is a, uh, a luxury saloon. The XK, which is a uh, sports car. And the XF, which is an executive uh, saloon. All fast vehicles, all relatively luxurious. You then look at, uh, at Land Rover. The, the real strap line there is breadth of capability, a, a unique blend, if you like, of uh, style, practicality, and capability. Now, I have to say, they're all large vehicles. They're not particularly economical in terms of their tailpipe uh, CO2. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, customers want to buy them. Uh, buying a car is a very emotional uh, uh, purchase, particularly for uh, uh, people in the UK, and I, particularly to some of the German guys I was talking to last night, particularly in Germany. Um, you know, desirability is a very important attribute for a car. If I look at uh, where the technology roadmap, uh, this is the uh, NAIGT roadmap, which is the new automotive innovation and growth team. I think every country has its own uh, version of this. This is the UK version. And what this shows is Starting at the uh, uh, right at the bottom, a relentless pursuit of efficiency improvement for vehicles. Look after the weight of the vehicle, the drag of the vehicle, you know, things like low rolling res resistance tires will all help you to use less CO2 as those vehicles roll along the road. The next one, fortunately, and I'm sort of hesitant to say this in um, uh, a battery electric vehicle forum, but internal combustion engines are going to be with us for quite a long time to come. And I think there's going to be a fairly uh, interesting shakeout over the next few years between low carbon fuels and uh, uh, electric, uh, electric technology. So we have to con continue another relentless pursuit of efficiency, improve the engine and the transmission efficiency of electric, uh, of, of conventional gasoline and diesel uh, uh, vehicles. Mild and micro hybrids, also known as stop-start systems, are going to become ubiquitous. So every car is going to have to have a stop-start system so that you're not wasting fuel when you're sitting at a junction or sitting at a set of traffic lights. Um, full hybrid, my opinion, personal opinion, is a transitional technology before we get greater levels of, um, of uh, electrification, but it's a uh, a technology that helps you to recycle energy around the powertrain, so it's, uh, it has its place. Then moving on to plug-in hybrid, mass market, uh, EV technology, and then sometime in the future, fuel cell technology. What I've tried to do here is show the various different uh, uh, types of electrification along the top. Uh, not only electrification, or kinetic um, hybrid at the end there, but uh, uh, look at the technologies along the top and the functions of that technology uh, uh, along the bottom. It ranges from, from stop-start, mild hybrid, medium hybrid, through full hybrid, uh, range extended electric vehicle and plug-in hybrid, electric vehicle and kinetic hybrid. Now, if I refer back to the slide that I showed you at the beginning, fast, beautiful cars and breadth of capability uh, for Land Rover, when you actually have a a really hard look at this, what you find is, is that electric vehicles are just not practical 
or electric propulsion technology by itself as a rechargeable technology is just not practical for large vehicles. It just doesn't stack up. Your battery ends up being far too big, your charging times end up being very long, your motors end up being uh, very large, it just doesn't work. Now, that's not to say it'll never work because vehicles get lighter, people's perception of luxury may change over the years. But where we are now, you know, luxury equals speed, luxury equals space and breadth of capability. So that's focused our research work into plug-in hybrids and range extended electric vehicles. Um, range extended electric vehicles, um, this, these are a few sort of uh, um, details about the uh, uh, various ar architectures. Basically the Reeve architecture is sized for uh, um, power, energy increases the uh, EV range or helps us to make the battery, char battery smaller. Uh, Plug-in hybrid, um, uh, power determines when the engine started, uh, it increases the range and also makes the battery um, smaller. In urban operation, plug-in hybrids, you really want to avoid starting the engine. So uh, uh, energy density is, is probably of secondary importance uh, in that constraint because you need to use the uh, the power in the battery to accelerate and regenerate uh, from the vehicle. These are the vehicles that we're uh, looking at in the research phase. Limo Green, which has had a lot of publicity uh, recently, this is a range extended electric vehicle with an internal combustion range extender, something like 145 kilowatts of electric drive. All the drive for that vehicle goes through the, uh, um, uh, the electric drive line. There's no mechanical link between the engine and the, uh, uh, and the wheels. Range of about 30 miles in plug-in capability and reasonable, reasonable performance. Uh, the other experimental vehicle we're working on is the Rangey plug-in uh, vehicle. This is based on a Range Rover Sport. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'd like to refer you there to, uh, I'll probably have a slide on this later on, but uh, uh, at the back of that vehicle, that big box is the uh, is the battery. Something like uh, um, 20 miles range in uh, electric mode uh, based on the, uh, on the UNEC 101 cycle, something like 84 grams uh, CO2, which is not bad for that size, of, uh, that size of vehicle. A bit more detail on the, uh, uh, the battery packaging. First thing is look at the size of it, 170 litres. Look at where it's at. Now, the only reason we can get away with this on this vehicle, um, because that's a right in the, uh, potentially in the crash zone of the vehicle, is because this is a body-on-frame vehicle. We can sort of put some fairly robust strengthening around the, uh, uh, the outside of the battery uh, to stop it getting hurt in, uh, in uh, uh, a collision. If you then start to look at uh, what that means, and uh, what this what this graph, uh, graph shows is the um, slightly unconventional, it shows the pack volume in litres and the, uh, uh, the, the range. When you, work this, uh, uh, when you work this through, the pack in the plug-in hybrid that I just showed you, the range E vehicle, gives you a usable uh, energy uh, level of something like 75 watt-hours per litre, which uh, is a figure I'd just like you to sort of hold in your minds for a second. Where we'd like to be, we'd like to have 100 kilometers uh, uh, EV range. Now bear in mind that this range is calculated by putting the vehicle through repeated new European drive cycles. So it's a very gentle cycle. That range will drop somewhat when you start to use the vehicle in, in, real, situ in, real, in real conditions. So. Where we, where, where we want to be is about sort of two and a half times better than, than where we are at the moment at a pack level. And this is my sort of lithium future uh, um, slide. Again, I've shown slightly unconventionally the, the energy density in watt hours per litre, so the volumetric uh, efficiency of the battery up the side. And I've put some points on there, which are the, um, the, the, which are the cell level... Uh, um, uh, uh, densities of uh, 
batteries which are available in the marketplace now based on test results, not based on uh, manufacturers' published data. This is based on results that we've tested. Uh, and it's quite interesting to note how much of that uh, capability you lose when you start to put this into a pack, when you start to put some uh, interconnects around it, a cooling system, all these things that uh, you, you lose quite a lot. And frankly, there isn't a breakthrough waiting around the corner. The practical limit there is something like double where it is at the moment. There may be some opportunities to improve the packaging density of batteries, and there may be some opportunities to, uh, um, uh, if you like, to improve the chemistry and get incremental improvements, but I don't think there's a breakthrough technology waiting for us uh, uh, to uh, improve this. Just talking a little bit about uh, energy density, it's not of primary importance. Um, when you look at the way batteries age, they, they age in two ways. They either age by uh, uh, reducing their capacity or increasing their, their resistance, which uh, reduces their power capability. This next uh, plot shows two, that black line at the top is the published data from two uh, cells when they're new. We've measured it, they, they correspond very closely to this. Um, as you take energy out, so you're going from along the, uh, um, the x-axis there, that's, that's basically that's a discharge curve as you're taking uh, energy out of the battery. And uh, uh, both of these chemistries have the same characteristics. But interestingly, they age in completely different ways. And uh, one ages by uh, uh, reducing its, uh, its energy capacity, one ages by reducing its power capacity. So when we select a battery for a luxury application, we, or I think for any application, we have to be very careful about, uh, um, about which one we choose. Um, because you, for, a, for um, a hybrid, for example, if you choose the wrong cell, you're going to start to lose um, uh, the acceleration and regeneration capability, hence fuel economy improvement uh, capability of the vehicle. If you choose the wrong one for an electric vehicle, where the power density may be less important, the range will start to, uh, start to reduce. What we're seeing from battery suppliers is uh, something that looks like this, um, which actually doesn't help us a great deal in terms of, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the headline energy density increases. What we'd like is something much more like this. What we'd really like is something like that, so that uh, um, we can uh, have an, age, uh, an, an aged battery that gives us, uh, gives us reasonable performance. That's about all I've got to, uh, uh, got to say. Um, energy density is important with respect to package and, uh, and, uh, and range, and it's important changes with the sort of particular application. Power density is important as well, but actually the safety, cost and life are, are very important uh, design factors for us as uh, vehicle manufacturers. I've done. If you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for listening.